So recently on my channel, I've been exploring the original Revision A Kim 1 mainboard. It came in a backplane full of other cool hardware, as you can see, RAM expansions, disk controllers, visual memory boards, and so on and so forth. So the thing that I love about the Kim 1 is that the hardware itself is simple enough for any one person to understand pretty much the whole thing. After all, there's one fairly simple 6502 CPU, two dead simple I.O. chips, and that's really the extent of the entire board. Those additional two chips are actually more than just I.O., they do RAM, ROM, I.O., and Timer, which makes them officially Riot chips, the coolest name in the pantheon of ICs. Here you can see the serial cable running in and coming into the Corsham I.O. board that's plugged in on the bottom left. You might be thinking, what the heck can you do with something like this, because it has no screen, it has no keyboard other than a little hex pad, and you'd be right, except once you've got I.O. input into it, you've got effectively a terminal remote on a desktop. We're going to go over there, we're going to enlist in GitHub, we're going to get the source code to Microsoft Basic, we're going to assemble that, we're going to convert it to a paper tape file, we're going to upload it into this thing as if it were connected to an ASR33 teletype, it's not going to know any different, and we're going to run Microsoft Basic from 1977 from the original sources. Now, the first thing we need, of course, is the source code to Microsoft Basic, which is available on GitHub, thanks to uh, the work of some fairly ingenious people and uh, some person who leaked it at some point, I guess. But Dave, is that legal, man? What about your NDA, man? No idea. I'm not sure that Microsoft has ever actually released this code on their own, although they did release GW Basic, which is, of course, derivative from this, so sort of by inference they have. I don't think they care based on the fact that GitHub is owned by Microsoft, and therefore they've had oh, probably a year or two to take it down if they actually cared by now, and they have not seen fit to do so. So until I hear differently or that it bothers them in any way, we'll assume not. I'm not a lawyer, though, so you should assume whatever it is that your attorney tells you. So from looking at the source, everything is really included by a single file called msbasic.s. So that's how they get everything in the right order. All we have to do is look at this file called make to see which tools it actually uses to do the build. We can see it uses CA65 and LD65, which are parts of the CC65 package, which I'm now going to install with Brew. If you're not familiar with Brew, it's basically a package manager for bros. First time through, I did this all on my PC under WSL2, but this time around I wanted a clean machine to make sure I didn't skip any steps while I was doing it, and so I'm using my Mac instead. Now you know. Alright, I'm going to run these tools to make sure I actually have them. LD65. Yep, it's good. And I'm going to flail around a bit here to make it look like I don't really know what the hell I'm doing with Unix before I launch it. Look at that. 0.21 seconds. Do it again. 0.21 seconds to build, what, nine variants of basic? That's pretty good. It would be interesting to know from Gates or Mark McDonald or somebody like that just how long it took to actually assemble on the original cross-assembler hardware. We have to go down actually into the temp directory, not KB9. Go into temp. There we go. Let's see. KB9.bin, KB9.label, KB9.0. We need KB9.ptp, which would be a paper tape file in MOS Technologies format. And to do that, I'm going to need a tool from the S record collection. I'm not really sure what S-Record is, besides it uh, is a package for doing text records of some kind. Now, as soon as S-Record is done installing, we're going to use the S-Rec cat tool in order to convert it to from binary to PTP in MOS Technologies format. Let's see what we get. How big is it? KB, let's just filter this a little bit better. Here we go, KB9. 22K, roughly, which is three times the size of the bin file, so it's a little wasty. Why is that? Well, let's have a look at the output. Basically, you're going to have every byte encoded as text, which is going to take up some extra space. So each line here starts with a semicolon, and the next line is the number of bytes in hex, so 18, whoops. So this column here is the number of bytes in hex that each row contains, so 24 in decimal, 18 in hex. Now, the next four bytes are going to be the address into memory on the Kim that this row is going to get placed into when it's read in by the paper tape reader functions. The rest of each row is made up of the 24 data bytes, followed by a 16-bit checksum of the entire row to let you know if it's been received properly or not. So here you can see the first bytes of the image are E9, 26, 07, and so on. As you can see at address 2000, it starts with E9, not 4C, which would be a jump. It doesn't start with clear decimal or transfer X or load X, transfer to the stack, any of those things that I would expect to see at the beginning of a program, so it's probably not at the beginning and we'll have to find that elsewhere. At the bottom, we have special case 00, 00 databytes, followed by 171, which is a count, presumably of lines, I would guess, and then the checksum of 171 by himself, which is, again, 171. 
That's one nice thing about being so wastefully human readable, you can look at this and know exactly what's going into memory at what address. Back on the PC, I've shared my serial ports with WSL subsystem so that I can run Minicom and other serial port tools. Once I'm in here, I'm going to make sure that everything is properly configured before talking to the Kim 1. One oddity is it has to be two stop bits. I'm already there, but I've got to make sure that I don't have any uh, hardware control of flow or software control for that matter. I want to make sure it's all off. Where is that? Let me see. Terminal settings? No. Port. Configure. There we go. Serial port setup. Okay, they're already both off. 2400, 8 and 2. You can usually get away with 4800, but I want to be conservative here and uh, not overload the Kim 1. And just like every stupid fake hacker video, we're in. All this monitor can really do is load bytes, write bytes, load paper tape, load cassette, and save to those two. So we're going to hit L for load. And then I'm going to upload in plain old ASCII the kb9.ptp uh, file. I've got it configured to add a line delay of 100 milliseconds and a character delay of 10 milliseconds. And you'll see that, oh, 200, I'm sorry, 210. Now it's going to hum along here and it's going to at about an average of 70 characters per second, which is 700 baud, even though we're running at uh, 2400 baud, the actual number of bytes transferred is uh, not impressive with the delays. Plus, it's even worse because these are much inflated bytes. We have to go all the way up to about 22 kilobytes instead of just the 8 that was in the original binary. So I'm going to fast forward this so you get to just watch it fly by, whereas I have to sit here and watch it live. Here's a 10x speed, so this would be about 740 characters per second. All right, no exaggeration. This is 5,000% speed up in Final Cut. All right, when we're done, it gets dropped back into the monitor. I'm going to check address 1000 again to make sure it's still 18, which it is. Now let's check address 2000, and it should be E9 as it is, because that was the first byte of our paper tape file. So at least the beginning loaded, and here's the 26, 07, and so on. So that's the beginning of our paper tape, and that all looks right in memory as it is. Now let's have a peek at address 4065, which is the jump start label in the map file. Or not jump start, it's cold start, I'm sorry. A2, probably load XFF. Transfer X to the stack is 86, 87. Transfer somewhere else. I don't know all these upcodes. A9, load A. So yeah, this looks like the beginning of something. Let's do it and just hit go. Let's see what happens. Memory size. Ah, victory is ours. We are actually in. So we'll say 60K because that's actually what I've got on this board. And we'll say 80 because that sounds fair for terminal. Yes, I do want... Oops, all caps. I'm sorry. Yes, I really want it. 44K almost free. It's better than my pet. So if I know my history, the first thing Paul Allen ever did when he got his first version of the paper tape up and running on the real Altair was to type print 2 plus 2 or something similar, so I'll try that. And what do I get? Syntax error. Because I'm a fool and don't have caps lock on. Let's try with caps lock. Print 2 plus 2 is 4. It is indeed working. So I'm going to try and enter a little basic program here. But there's no backspace, so I'm kind of, uh, 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 start over. Uh, for, uh, no, uh, this could be painful. Oh, damn it, lowercase. Why won't you learn? Caps lock. What the heck did I do? Oh, tan instead of tab. Oops. Typo. Control C. Let's see. I can fix that. Run it again. There we go. Now, witness the computing power of this fully armed and operational Kim 1. And here it is at 19.2 kilobaud. If the uh, Kim 1 could keep up at 19.2 kilobaud, but it cannot. But this is exactly what it would look like if it could. Computationally, it can. It just can't do the I.O. through its little current draw loop thing that it has. And here it is at 115 kilobaud. Dare to dream. If you have any interest in old computing topics like this, make sure you're subscribed to my channel where we'll go through the entire Kim 1 and that entire stack of boards and backplanes and try and get them all working one by one. And when they do, I'll show you the steps just like I did today.